stopping Thanos with a hostess fruit pie, whatever. Oh, hi! You caught me exiting the new Avengers movie. Speaking of the Avengers, let's talk about one of their best writers. Hello! Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. You know, when it comes to great Avengers writers, there's a lot of contenders. I've talked before on this channel about Roy Thomas. He wrote the epic Kree Scroll War storyline. There are guys more recently like Brian Michael Bendis. Now, he introduced uh, heavy hitters like Spider Man and Wolverine to the team. He introduced various spin offs. He had a lengthy run on the Avengers, and a lot of people love him for it. There are writers like Roger Stern in the 80s. That was the guy I first read stories about the Avengers by, and he had a fantastic storyline where the evil masters of evil actually defeated the Avengers. Epic storyline. More recently, there was Jonathan Hickman's incredible two-year run on various Avengers titles building up to Secret Wars. That was a storyline where the multiverse itself was being destroyed by various cosmic beings, and it tested the Avengers' moral compass, and it introduced characters like Thanos' Black Order. In other words, there's a lot of great writers, but one that I want to talk to you about today is Kurt Busiek. Kurt came in at a time when the Avengers were doing terribly. They were faltering, sales were not good. He came and introduced new interpersonal relationships, came up with new stakes, and just rebuilt the team at a time when it really needed it. I think he's a great Avengers writer. Let's break down his various techniques and his work on the Avengers. Kurt Busiek was born in Boston in 1960. He grew up in nearby Lexington, where he befriended future comic book creator Scott McCloud, introducing him to comics. Busick sent in letters to comics as a fan for years before breaking into the industry with a Green Lantern backup story in 1983. Over the next several years, he wrote various stories at Marvel and DC, but made his big impact in 1993 with the limited series Marvels, with painted artwork by Alex Ross. In 1995, Busick began writing his creator-owned series, Astro City, about the superheroes and citizens that live in a fictional city by the same name. In 1997, he launched Thunderbolts at Marvel, which was a team of supervillains masquerading as superheroes. And then he helped relaunch Avengers in 1998. After his lengthy run on that title, he wrote the Avengers Justice League crossover between DC and Marvel in 2003. The following year, he began a long run on Conan the Barbarian through Dark Horse, and by 2006, he was writing Superman at DC. He's primarily been writing at DC since then, and his series Astro City began being published by DC's Vertigo imprint in 2013. Busick's work has several tropes that I think we can analyze through his work in the Avengers, but there are two that I especially want to focus on. The first is his deep love of continuity. He finds new ways to use previous stories to recontextualize new stories. And second, he does something that I think could be classified as reconstruction. It's a direct response to the years and years of superhero comics going through something called deconstruction. In the mid-80s, it became a trend to make comics more grim and gritty. Some of this was because of stories like Miracle Man, Watchmen, and Brat Pack, which deconstructed superhero narratives. Essentially, it took the superheroes we'd been reading and placed them in a modern context, introducing the consequences of superheroes existing in the real world. Ideas like alienation, fear from the public, and cynical vigilantism were explored. But Busick's work tends to take that idea of a modern, realistic world and add superheroes that still aspire to be noble and selfless, truly heroic. In his Avengers run, he finds several concrete angles to explore regarding superheroes in a recognizable world that are still identifiable as superheroes, not just people with powers. The Avengers title was flailing in the 90s. That decade saw the team comprised of less popular members Black Knight, Crystal, Cersei, Hercules, and longtime members Black Widow and Vision. 
It felt directionless, with the team more recognizable for wearing matching leather jackets than for battling any notable threats. This was followed by a bloated cosmic crossover storyline called Operation Galactic Storm, and an infamous storyline where Iron Man is revealed to be a brainwashed sleeper agent for time-traveling villain Kang. He was replaced with a teenager version of himself that the Avengers plucked out of the time stream. The sales were poor, and Marvel essentially wrote the team out of the main continuity and handed the characters over to popular creators Jim Lee and Rob Liefeld to reimagine in a new continuity. That experiment also failed to generate much interest after the first couple of issues. So Marvel handed the title over to Kurt Busiek, who teamed up with popular artist George Perez, who had had a notable run on the title in the early 70s when he was just breaking in. This run was volume three of the title, and it kicked off with a bang, uniting nearly every character who had ever been an Avenger, from founding members like Wasp, Thor, and Iron Man, to popular mainstays like Vision and Scarlet Witch, to more obscure newer characters like Darkhawk and Magdalene. The team goes up against the powerful sorceress Morgan Le Fay, who magically remakes the world into a medieval fantasy where the Avengers serve as her brainwashed knights. At this point in time, it was just great reading an Avengers title that actually had the heavy hitters of Captain America, Thor, and Iron Man back on the team. It gave the team direction. Now, sometimes the exposition was a little heavy, but at the same time, Busick had a knack for getting the characters' voices right. They felt authentic, and he upped the stakes with big adventures. This was definitely on full display in his next big arc, which would ironically go on to inspire the second Avengers movie almost 20 years later. Maybe that's not that ironic. Issue 19 strikes a balance between the soap opera home life of the Avengers, primarily focused on the supporting cast, like new members Justice and Firestar, and the high-stakes action of a big enemy. In this case, it was one of the team's most powerful enemies, Ultron. Busick used the killer robot to tie together threads from his previous appearances, with Ultron planning to remake the world in his image. To do this, he not only creates hundreds of drones of himself, but he also kidnaps various Avengers that he considers his family. That includes Ant-Man, aka Hank Pym, aka Giant-Man, who created the first Ultron, and whose brain patterns were used in Ultron's creation. As well as Hank's wife, Janet, aka the Wasp, whose brain patterns Ultron used to create a robot bride named Jocasta, who turned on him. Ultron also kidnaps Vision, who Ultron himself built, but who similarly turned on him, and the Avenger Wonder Man, whose brain patterns were used to build the Vision. Scarlet Witch is also abducted. She is loved by both the Vision and Wonder Man, and Ultron used her brain patterns to build his current wife, Alchema. Finally, Ultron kidnaps the supervillain Grim Reaper, the real-life brother of Wonder Man and a previous accomplice of Ultron. Ultron also has one of his biggest victories by using his drones to decimate the populace of the fictional Eastern European nation of Slorania. The concept of an army of Ultrons and his attack on an Eastern European nation was used in 2015's Avengers movie sequel, Age of Ultron, where he attacks Sokovia. Ultimately, the Avengers are able to utilize vibranium to destroy Ultron's adamantium body. All of the references to previous character interactions with Ultron, as well as him using previous iterations of himself, are some pretty serious continuity nods. At the same time, they're really not there just for reference. They're there to recontextualize and build up who Ultron is as a character. A lot of Busick's supervillains will still have an element of humanity to them. They'll have a recognizable goal that we can understand. In this case, Ultron is very lonely, and he's attempting to create a bizarre version of a family for himself. Uh, that sort of cynical but recognizable humanity is definitely a hallmark of Busick's villains. At the same time, these are villains that are very dangerous. They've got, they're, they're a big threat, and for the Avengers to ultimately be able to get all the way to a point where they can overcome such a dangerous threat makes them all the more heroic. In a related story, Kurt Busiek co-created the new title Thunderbolts. 
That was a team of superheroes who, it's revealed, is actually the Masters of Evil, former Avengers villains, led by Baron Zemo. They operate in disguise as new heroes during the time the Avengers were missing from the Earth and actually being used in the stories by Lee and Liefeld in a parallel universe. Most of those villains find that they actually like being heroes, even though it began as a ruse to steal Avengers secrets. Eventually, their secret is revealed, and Baron Zemo goes on the run, but the Avengers member Hawkeye shows up and offers to lead them if they really want a second chance. This is an example of Busick's uncynical look at superheroes, as well as utilizing their history properly. In the comics, Hawkeye began as a thief before being recruited and rehabilitated by the Avengers. It represents a sensible bit of character growth based off of past continuity. And if you're a big fan of the Avengers, there's no Avengers story with more nods to prior issues than Busick's 12-issue limited series, Avengers Forever, with artwork by Carlos Pacheco. This story involves a threat to the cosmos, and Avengers sidekick Rick Jones utilizes a latent power within himself to pull together an Avengers team from the past, present, and future to go on a time-traveling adventure against Avengers enemy Kang the Conqueror from the far future. Along the way, the team comes across various iterations of the team, and the overall story is full of nods to dozens of Avengers storylines and ties together loose threads from them. The Avengers by Kurt Busiek is one of my favorites for a few reasons. It's a team staffed by the heavy hitters, Captain America, Thor, and Iron Man, and some fan favorites like Vision and Scarlet Witch. It has the Avengers go up against big threats like Ultron and Kang, threats too big for any one hero. It has a healthy balance of the Avengers living their daily life with their love lives and concerns peppered in for some good old-fashioned soap opera, and it came at just the right time. The Avengers had been floundering for almost a decade with some really mediocre to outright bad storylines before Kurt Busiek came in, and he helped ground these Avengers while still making it fun, big adventure. Uh, it was grounded with things like political intrigue, uh, the interference and influence of the news media, uh, political losses like losing the country of Slorania. So there were actual stakes, there were influences from the real world that we could understand. It really created for a great book. That said, it's not all perfect. There can be pages that are just walls of text. It can be a bit daunting sometimes, but fortunately, the dialogue tends to be varied and engaging. Sometimes the core conflicts aren't built up quite as much as it seems like they could be. While there's no way to know exactly why this is, the fact is, writer Kurt Busiek was battling mercury poisoning during his tenure on the book. That can inflict physical pain and cause difficulties concentrating, so he was probably giving it his all, yet still not able to have as much time to contemplate the best possible execution of a story as compared to, say, his more recent years on a title like Astro City. Finally, his addition to the Avengers of a new character, Triathlon, is a miss. Triathlon is a new superhero given powers by a new agey group called the Triune Understanding that eventually is revealed to be a group of villains who plan to sacrifice their members to gain evil powers. They secretly stole the powers of an old superhero named the 3D Man and gave them to Delroy Garrett, who operated as Triathlon without knowing the dark secret of his powers. Unfortunately, a government liaison almost forces the African-American character onto the team. If the Avengers had simply taken him on, it might not read as badly, but the title has a poor history of black representation. In issue 181 of Volume 1, Weasley government liaison Henry Guyrich forced the Avengers to hire the Falcon to meet a newly mandated diversity quota. Having a wide variety of characters is a good idea. It creates opportunities for new viewpoints and conflicts. But having a government character force Falcon or Triathlon onto the team makes it so readers aren't on their side right from the get-go. 
While I can't honestly say that Kurt Busiek is my all-time favorite Avengers writer bar none, I will say that he easily makes it into my top five, and that is saying something. There have been a lot of writers for the Avengers, and I've read a lot of Avengers books. Busiek's work came at a time when the book needed to do well, or it could have faded into obscurity. It had been doing quite poorly for quite a long time. So he really rescued the Avengers and revitalized them. I think that's very much worth remembering. I also think that the stories that he wrote for the Avengers hold up. They're still good reading. Now, they are a little bit dated. For instance, it's very entertaining to witness the Avengers go up against hundreds and hundreds of drones of Ultron, and there's no concern of Ultron, say, uploading his consciousness to the internet. That just wasn't a thing that anyone had in mind that would absolutely have to be addressed with an Ultron story today. Uh, but Busick is great at knowing the continuity of his characters. Uh, famously, when he was a letter hack, when he was just a fan writing in letters to Marvel Comics, he actually came up with an idea for how to resurrect Jean Grey of the X-Men, who had turned into the Phoenix and destroyed a galaxy and died. And a lot of writers were like, well, you know, she, she was written out. She was, she was killed. And it's too bad. She was a great character. You can't bring her back. But he had the idea that, like, no, I, what if you just said that the Phoenix Entity created a duplicate of Jean Grey, and that Jean Grey was in a cocoon at the bottom of Jamaican Bay? Well, that story got passed around from writer to writer, and eventually it made it into the actual comics as the way that Jean Grey was brought back to life. So that was something he created just as a fan, based on his just huge encyclopedic knowledge of past comics. He loves Silver Age stuff, and it's cool seeing that stuff recontextualized into the modern day. Uh, anyway, talking about great stories, great art, let's take a look at what kind of great art came in on regarding fan art this week. Yeah, let's take a look. Seth Leoric drew Judge Dredd punching Infotron in the face. I've been there. Jerry Mewawala from India sent in this gorgeous artwork of me listing my own personal tropes. Alex Boas Menu from Quebec illustrated a similar idea of the comic tropes host and his recurring themes. Sorry if I butchered your last name, Alex. The fear is real. Matt Farmer spells it out. I'm almost out of gachapon. You can see more of Matt's work on Instagram. This charming comic strip comes from BB Comics in South Africa. They've been doing a comic strip in their local paper for two years. They have a hashtag if you want to find out more. Grimlock sends in a new piece. This time, it's me as He-Man. But what Grimlock doesn't know is that before I transform, I'm just as shredded, but I have a schoolboy haircut. Have you ever wanted to see me as the mask? Well, Wiley Parkhurst has you covered. I need that shirt, by the way. Very colorful. Finally, Marcio Guamarez from Brazil practiced drawing digitally to create this artwork featuring myself and the Midnight Mink. All right, everyone, if you would like to send in artwork that has something to do with comic tropes, I'll definitely feature it. Just send it in to this email address, comictropes at gmail.com, and I'll feature it. And then, out of everybody that I feature, I'll draw one winner to win a Gachapon prize that I picked up in Japan comes to us from the Gotcha Pony machine that was donated by Lunar Shine Store. So there are eight pieces this week. I've got eight numbers. Uh, I'm just going to grab this bag here and we're gonna just do a random drawing, see which artist won this week. Let's see who got a Gotcha Pon. It's number seven and number seven seems to be Wiley Parkhurst. Wiley. You have won. I will collect your contact information, and I'm happy to send that your way. Thank you so much, everybody, for the beautiful artwork. That's very, very exciting and fun. Uh, running low on gotcha ponds, I do plan on replenishing it at the end of the year, but we'll probably go through a small period where I won't have prizes. You're always welcome to send in the fan art. I'll do my best to include it. Just know that I'm temporarily going to be running out of gotcha ponds, and honestly, I'm really way behind on mailing those out, so Bear with me if I just need a short break from that. Um, 
channel's continuing to do well, so thank you everybody for your support. If you would like to support this show in a way other than just subscribing and hitting like, well, I'm always grateful for that. That's why I've got things like Patreon and Coffee. if you want to support me on an ongoing basis or a one-time tip. And just so you know, that support really does just go back into the show. Uh, that goes towards getting things like comics, paying for my subscription on the various Adobe programs, things like that. So there's a, there's a certain expense to making this show every week. I know I sort of do it on the cheap, but hopefully at some point I would love to upgrade, you know, the camera, um, the lighting equipment. It's, it's very good. I think I'm like constantly making small improvements, but what can I say? I want this show to be the best that it can be. And so I'm always going to work towards improving it. So any support that you do give, I just want you to know that that does go back into the show. Uh, I am not sitting pretty and, uh, you, you know, putting it towards trips and things like that. that that's, that's really my own money. But anyway, that's just me uh, just nattering on. Uh, it's late at night. I'm tired. Uh, I got to get this thing edited so that I can get it out to you. I uh, haven't missed a week yet. I, I don't plan on taking a vacation anytime too soon if I can avoid it. I want to keep doing the show. Uh, I've got so many ideas. I've just got so many ideas that I want to get to. I think next week, it's been a little while since we've done something indie, so I've got a couple ideas towards very important, influential indie creators. People that have, excuse me, I'm just uh, about to uh, burp and fall asleep, I guess. I'm, I'm a baby. But I've got some ideas for things uh, uh, still to come um, that inspired and influenced the comic book industry. Wow. Uh, you're literally catching me running out of energy as I speak to you. So I'm going to call it an episode here. Thank you everyone for watching. And until I catch you next time, keep reading comics.